the Voxari Imperium made a grave mistake. They tortured an innocent human girl. They thought the United Earth Federation would let it slide. Dead fucking wrong. We showed those alien bastards the very definition of hell. Captain Thomas Williams scowled as the subspace transmission flickered onto the view screen of the UEF Dauntless. The sneering face of Murloc, commander of a remote Voxari outpost, filled the display. How you have one solar day to hand over the human desecrator, Samantha Johnson, Murloc growled. This affront to our most holy temple cannot go unpunished. If you do not comply, the mighty Voxari Imperium will have no choice but to declare war on your pathetic federation. Thomas slammed a fist on the armrest of his command chair, jaw clenched. Samantha, a wide-eyed nineteen-year-old junior ambassador, had accidentally brushed against a sacred Voxari artifact during a cultural exchange tour. An innocent mistake, but the fanatically devout Voxari were infamous for purification through suffering, weeks of brutal ritualized torture as penance for any perceived slight against their religion. I'm not turning her over to be tortured, you sick zealot, Thomas spat. She has diplomatic immunity. Your Federation laws mean nothing to the Voxari, Murloc sneered. You have one day, human, or your precious Federation burns. As the viewscreen went dark, Thomas gripped the armrests, knuckles white. The Federation Council was ordering him to stall, to let them negotiate. But he knew, with cold certainty, that the Voxari would never back down. He was facing an impossible choice between his duty to protect an innocent girl and his oath to obey orders. If he caved to the Voxari's despicable demands, they won. If he refused, billions could die in the inevitable war. The clock was ticking. The fate of humanity hung in the balance, and Thomas had no idea what the hell he was going to do. Thomas gathered his senior officers in the dauntless briefing room. Their grim faces reflected the weight of the decision before them. Commander Petrov spoke first, his Russian accent thicker than usual. Captain, we must evacuate Samantha and all human personnel immediately. That fanatic Murloc will invent an excuse for war no matter what we do. Dr. Nakamura shook his head. I've studied Voxari purification techniques. The victims are left shells of their former selves, physically and psychologically shattered. We can't abandon Samantha to that nightmare. Pavel Ivanov, the ship's diplomat, raised a hand. The Voxari have never lost a war. Their fleet numbers in the tens of thousands, their soldiers in the billions. An all-out conflict would be disastrous. Thomas pinched the bridge of his nose. Each option led to catastrophe. Surrender Samantha to torture, or risk the lives of billions in a bloody war humanity might not win. He dismissed the meeting with a heavy sigh. I'll inform you of my decision within the hour. In his quarters, Thomas placed a secure call to Admiral Sear. The older man's face flickered onto the screen, his expression grave. Thomas, I wish I had better news. Voxari warships are amassing on our borders. Evacuation, it's no longer an option. They'll take it as an admission of guilt, a reason to invade. Thomas's stomach turned to lead. Petrov was right, war was inevitable, but how many would die for his choice? He glanced at the chrono on his desk, less than twenty hours until the deadline. Leaning back in his chair, he closed his eyes, the weight of two civilizations pressing down on him. There had to be another way. There had to be. Thomas stared at the chrono, the relentless countdown to the deadline searing into his mind. No word from the Federation Council. No last-minute reprieve from this impossible choice. With a heavy heart, he summoned Lieutenant Kaori Sato to his quarters. Lieutenant, he said, his voice strained, I need you to prepare a stasis pod and a long-range stealth shuttle quietly. Sato's eyes widened, but she nodded. Yes, sir, for Samantha. Thomas affirmed with a curt nod. We're getting her out of here, beyond Voxari space. You'll take her to the first Federation ship you encounter. Hand her over along with this. He pressed a data drive into Sato's palm. My full report, everything that's happened. Understood, Captain. Sato pocketed the drive, her jaw set with determination. 
As she left to make the preparations, Thomas steeled himself for what came next. He hailed Murloc, schooling his features into a mask of somber resignation. Commander Murloc, he began, his voice heavy. I regret to inform you that Samantha Johnson has taken her own life. The shame of her transgression against your holy temple, it was too much for her to bear. Murloc's eyes narrowed. Where is the body? Cremated, a ritual pyre according to our custom. Thomas held his breath, praying the lie would hold. I demand to inspect the remains. Murloc's tone brooked no argument. Thomas forced a nod. Of course, I'll have them brought to you immediately. He ended the transmission, his heart pounding. They had no body, no ashes, but they did have the remains of Lieutenant Commander Haruki Tanaka, killed in a tragic shuttle accident days before. No family to claim him. Thomas gave the order, and within minutes a Voxari shuttle was docking with the Dauntless. He met them in the airlock, a sealed urn clutched in his hands. The ashes of Samantha Johnson, he said, holding out the urn with a solemn bow. The Voxari delegation took the urn, subjecting it to a battery of tests with their advanced forensic scanners. An hour crawled by, each second an eternity. Thomas was certain they would see through the deception. But then, incredibly, Murloc nodded. The Voxari are satisfied. We consider this matter closed. As the Voxari shuttle disengaged and vanished into the void, Thomas sagged against the airlock wall, his breath leaving him in a rush. Had it worked? Was the war averted? He could only pray that Sato and Samantha were safely away, racing towards the Federation border. He tapped his comm badge. Commander Petrov, you have the con. I'll be in my quarters. In the privacy of his cabin, Thomas poured himself a generous measure of synthahol. He raised the glass in a silent toast. To peace, however fragile, however temporary. Thomas took a swig of the synthahol, savouring the burn as it slid down his throat. He closed his eyes, hoping for a brief moment of peace. But only six hours later, the comm unit in his quarters chimed with an urgent message from the bridge. Captain, we've intercepted a wide-band transmission from Murloc to the Voxari homeworld, Commander Petrov reported, his voice tight. You need to see this. Thomas strode onto the bridge, his stomach twisting as he saw Murloc's sneering face on the viewscreen. Tell us humans and their dishonorable deception, Murloc gloated. Did they really think they could hide the desecrator from our righteous judgment? The image shifted, and Thomas's heart seized. A Voxari warship weapons blazing bore down on a small shuttle, Kaori and Samantha's shuttle. The warship's cannons tore through the shuttle's meager shields, breaching its hull. Armoured Voxari troopers swarmed into the crippled vessel, and moments later they dragged a struggling Samantha before Murloc. Behold, Murloc crowed, the Federation has shown its true colours. They are liars and oath-breakers, unworthy of a place in our galaxy. Samantha trembled as Murloc's clawed hand gripped her face. This one will be purified, he snarled. Her suffering will be a testament to human treachery. As a shuttle carried Samantha away to the Voxari homeworld and the torments that awaited her, Murloc turned back to the camera. The mighty Voxari Imperium will descend upon Earth, he roared. We will burn their cities, shatter their fleets, and bring the light of purification to their entire misbegotten species. The transmission cut out, and a deathly silence fell over the bridge. Thomas gripped the back of his command chair, his mind reeling. Murloc had played him. The war he had tried so desperately to prevent was upon them. Sensors are picking up Voxari ships amassing on our borders, Petrov said, his voice hollow. Their armada, it's underway. Thomas felt a cold certainty settle over him. There was no averting this conflict, but perhaps there was still a way to win it. He strode to the comm station. Get me a secure channel to Admiral Sear, now. Moments later, Zia's face filled the screen. Thomas took a deep breath. Admiral Crucible Omega. Shai paled, his eyes widening. For a long moment he was silent, then he gave a single grim nod. Confirmed. 
The Voxari Armada surged into Earth's solar system, a vast swarm of warships poised to rain destruction upon the human homeworld. Executor Zaxus, supreme commander of the invasion force, stood on the bridge of his dreadnought, a cruel smile playing across his reptilian features. Scan the planet, he ordered. I want to see their faces when we begin the bombardment. But as the sensors swept over Earth, Zaxus's smile faltered. The orbital defense platforms hung silent and lifeless in the void. The planet's surface showed no signs of activity, no desperate mobilization of armies or evacuation of cities. Earth was a ghost world, abandoned and undefended. Zaxus slammed a clawed fist on the arm of his command chair. Where are they? he snarled. Where are the humans? His subordinates worked the sensor arrays frantically, but the results were the same. Earth appeared to be completely deserted. Zaxus's eyes narrowed. This had to be a trick, some kind of human deception, but he would not be deterred. Begin landing the troops, he commanded. Secure every city, every base, every stronghold. If the humans are hiding, we will flush them out. Dropships and landing craft descended on Earth like a plague of locusts, disgorging millions of Voxari warriors onto the planet's surface. They marched through empty streets and silent buildings, their weapons primed and ready. And then the trap was sprung. Across the globe, in dozens of cities and military installations, hidden antimatter warheads detonated with the force of a thousand suns. The ground heaved and buckled, skyscrapers toppled, and the very air ignited. The Voxari troops, caught in the open, were vaporized instantly their ashes mingling with the radioactive dust that billowed into the atmosphere. In space, the Voxari fleet reeled as a swarm of stealth nuclear missiles erupted from concealed silos on Earth's moon. The warship's defences, designed for ship-to-ship -ship combat, were useless against the unexpected onslaught. Hulls ruptured, reactors went critical, and the void blossomed with the dying fires of shattered vessels. It was over in hours. More than two-thirds of the Voxari Armada, the pride of the Imperium, was reduced to glowing wreckage. The invasion force was annihilated, and Earth, though scarred and poisoned, was free of the enemy. On the Voxari homeworld, a battered murloc was hauled before the Council of Elders, his once proud bearing replaced by trembling terror. "'You have led us to ruin!' the High Elder roared. "'Your arrogance and cruelty have brought the Imperium to its knees.' Murloc prostrated himself, his pleas for mercy falling on deaf ears. The elder's judgment was swift and brutal, and Murloc's head was separated from his shoulders in a spray of viscous blood. On the bridge of the Dauntless, Thomas stood before the viewport, his gaze fixed on the ravaged earth below. The planet was a ruin, its cities reduced to smouldering craters, its skies choked with ash. But humanity had survived, thanks to the daring evacuation to secret off-world colonies. The price had been high, unimaginably so, but they had endured. Thomas's contemplation was broken by an urgent comm from the ship's medical bay. He listened intently, his heart racing, then closed the channel with a shaking hand. Samantha was alive. She had been found drifting in a damaged Voxari escape pod, weak but stable. A rescue team was bringing her to the Dauntless for treatment. Thomas felt a wave of emotion crash over him. Relief, joy, grief, and a profound weariness. They had won, but the cost had been staggering. Earth was a wasteland, and the road to recovery would be long and arduous. But as he watched the rescue shuttle approach, carrying the young woman whose plight had started it all, Thomas felt a flicker of hope amid the ashes. The war was over. The struggle to rebuild had just begun. You have reached the end of the story. If you enjoyed this story and want to support us, please leave a like and subscribe to our channel, and for every comment that says 88, I will heart every single one of them. Thank you for your time.